Hi everyone, it's Kate, and this is the second video for week one of Math 23. So we've learned a little bit about fields and their axioms, and you might be wondering what exactly do fields have to do with linear algebra? Well, let's take a look. Okay, when we write something like this, f to the n, that denotes the set of ordered lists of n elements from a field f. Now that may look totally confusing, but let's actually pick a field. Most of the time in this class when we're studying linear algebra, we'll be working in Rn. So let's look at a concrete example. R2. What does that mean? First of all, let's write that down. When we talk about R2, that looks like this. And according to our definition here, this denotes the set of ordered lists of two elements from the field of real numbers. Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, an ordered list of two elements from the field of real numbers means that R2 is the entire space of all the possible sets of two real numbers. And when we say an ordered list, this means that order matters. So let's think of an example of a possible element in R2. What would it look like? Well, here's one. This is two real numbers, one and one, or here's another one, one and two. And note the fact that since this is an ordered list, when I swap the order of these and write two, one, like this, that refers to a new element in the space. So when you think about all the possible combinations of ordered lists of two elements of the real numbers, what exactly is R2? You've actually been working in R2 your entire life, right? Well, since algebra. The Cartesian plane. It is two-dimensional space. That's what we call R2. Similarly, R3 is three-dimensional space. R4, R5, R6, we stop being able to visualize these things, but these are some of the spaces that we may be working in. Now, it's worth noting that you could certainly be working in the field of complex numbers, where C2, for instance, would be the set of ordered lists of two elements from the field of complex numbers, and you could be working in Z5, and in fact, you will be doing some examples there. Uh, but that's the basic idea of how we start thinking about points and vectors. Well, what's the difference between a point and a vector? First of all, a given element of Fn can be regarded either as a point, which represents position data, or as a vector, which represents incremental data or incremental change. So if an element in Fn is a point, we represent it by a bold letter P, like this, and write it as a column of elements enclosed in parentheses. So you guys have seen things written horizontally for our purposes in linear algebra. It's much better to write them vertically. So the point 1 comma 1 is exactly the same as this point. For our work that we're going to do with matrices and matrix multiplication, it's a lot easier for us to write vertically when we're talking about points. So we have points down. What about vectors? Well, if an element of Fn is a vector, then we represent it by a bold letter with an arrow above it, like this, and we write it as a column of elements enclosed in square brackets. Now obviously when you're writing out problem sets by hand, it's very difficult to bold things just by themselves, so if you're talking about a point, you really want to make it clear that it has these curved parentheses around it. And if you're talking about a vector, you add that arrow, and then you add the square brackets. And like we said earlier, vectors are incremental data. What this vector means or signifies is that there's a change, a decrease of 0.2 in the first component, an increase of 1.3 in the second component, an increase of 2.2 in the third component. You guys have probably actually seen vectors before, at least in maybe physics or geometry, depending on what your mathematical background is. All right, so let's do some of the operations that we can do with vectors and points. So to add a vector to a point, we just add the components in the same positions together. So if we were adding P and V together, we would just take the following. 
Well, here it is. And note that I haven't included the brackets yet. The question is for you. If I start with P, which is a position data, and I add a vector V, which is incremental data, what do I get? If I start with a position and I add an increment, do I end up with an increment or do I end up with a position? The answer is I end up with another position. So if I start somewhere and then I add an increment, I'll end up at another location or another position. So I want to put those curved brackets on there. And that's how I would write my answer. All right, so let's take a look. When we're drawing this geometrically, let's scroll down a bit here. Leaving that behind. So when we're drawing this geometrically, we represent this by anchoring the vector at the initial point P right over here, and then we draw in the appropriate vector V. Of course, this is not the V that we're talking about up here. This has three increments and we're in the plane down here. But when you're doing drawings, uh, this, is, this is how they should look. If you're adding a vector to a point, you anchor the vector at the point and then the vector is a particular size. So for instance, if this was a vector that had uh, an increment change of three in the first component or in the x direction, then an increment change of a half in the y direction, that seems pretty reasonable there. But this is exactly what this would look like. And of course, our final answer, the sum of P and V is that last point Q. So to add a vector to a vector, that's pretty straightforward, uh, computationally speaking. We just add them together component by component. And if we're adding an increment to another increment, that is going to give us an increment in total. So the result of a vector being added to a vector is another vector. Now, when we're geometrically drawing this, our first vector is V here. And the way that we add a vector W to V is just to anchor W where V leaves off. So our total sum, V plus W, starts where V begins and ends where W ends when they're aligned in this appropriate way. All right. Last topic on this page. Let's scroll down a bit more. To multiply a vector by a scalar, or to find the scalar multiple of a vector, we multiply each component by the scalar. So let's take a look at this vector V. This could reasonably be written as the vector 2, 1. So let's write that down. Now, if we wanted to multiply that by 2 to find 2v, all we have to do is multiply each component by 2. Let's do that. 2 times 2 is 4. 2 times 1 is 2. So 2v would be 4, 2. And of course, if you're drawing this geometrically, we start with our original vector v. And 2v is going to be in the exact same direction as the original v, but twice as long. Note that minus 2v is identical to 2v except for one small but important change, and that is that it is in the exact opposite direction as positive 2v. The arrowhead is on the other side of the vector. Moving on. All right, so... We know how to add vectors together. We know how to multiply vectors by scalars. We need to clarify one quick thing, which is really important for our notation for the rest of our linear algebra section. The standard basis vectors. Note that we define the standard basis vector to be written E sub K. That is a vector that has one in its kth component and zero in all the other components. So for instance, if you are in R2, the first basis vector, E1, looks something like this. The second basis vector, E2, looks like this. Now note that in R2, there is no E3 because E3 would involve a one in the third component and there is no third component in R2. Similarly, if we wanted to talk about E1 in R3, it would look like this, and so on and so forth for E2 and E3. Now, what's the usefulness of these? Well, let's take a look. Geometrically, the standard basis vectors in R2 
are usually associated with one unit east or one unit in the x direction as you're used to thinking about the Cartesian plane and E2 is one unit north or one unit in the y direction as you're thinking about the Cartesian plane. And note that I mean the positive x direction and the positive y direction. There are two really important things that will do you quite a bit of good by thinking about them now and sort of what the repercussions are of these two facts. But one is up here, that there will always be n standard basis vectors in Fn. Even worth highlighting. There will always be n standard basis vectors in Fn. We'll return to that fact again and again and again, and we'll even prove it's true. Um, later in a more general sense. And also another thing to make sure you're aware of is that let's look at this concrete example of our two, of our two basis vectors up here at the top, E1 and E2. It's worth noting that every single vector that you can possibly write in R2 can be written as a sum of scalar multiples of the two standard basis vectors quite easily. So two things to keep in mind. And that concludes this video. This is enough understanding to get you through the second of the R scripts for Math 23.